Welcome to the latest Notes from the Control Tower, and in this episode I'm going to talk about Wargaming's decision to leave Russia and its implications for World of Warplanes, the June Bundles, where you can get three premium aircraft as bonus items, along with gold, and moving pilots between planes. Hello there, and it's been a while since I did an episode of Notes from the Control Tower, and the reason? Wargaming's announcement in early April that it was leaving Russia and Belarus and I wanted to see what would transpire with respect to World of Warplanes, which is a niche game in Wargaming stable. So let's get into that topic straight away. First, let's have some background as to why uh, Wargaming's move out of Russia and Belarus is particularly relevant to World of Warplanes. Uh, and what you see here is part of an interview given in August 2020, or maybe just slightly before that, to VentureBeat by Victor Kisley, the CEO of Wargaming. He was asked a question about World of Warships, which is why this section is entitled World of Warships. Uh, and it, the question was, what made World of Warships succeed while World of Warplanes didn't? And I want to draw your attention to this section here. And Victor Kisley says, in translation, obviously the game is still running. We didn't promote it and push it and market it on every land post. This is after two failures, in his view, uh, to make a success of World of Warplanes. But there are a couple of hundred thousand people who play it, the diehards. We are diehards, apparently. We're not shutting it down. It's slightly profitable. It's not through the roof. It used to actually burn money, but we managed to streamline and optimize the team. Read into that what you will. My view is that um, many of the people who were associated with World War Planes departed in October of 2019, including Kirill Gladsky, who led the redevelopment of uh, World of War Planes into version 2. He went to tanks. And to conclude here, uh, our approach is so that those players who love the game can still play it. We're just not pushing it aggressively. And that goes a long way to explaining why World of War Planes is not marketed and not promoted. Um, the view of Victor Kisley is that they'd had two goes at the game, failed on both occasions, and he wasn't going to spend any more time on it. However, wasn't going to let the game go. The move out of Belarus and Russia changes things because the small team that looked after World of War Planes was based in Minsk and Minsk is in Belarus. It's anybody's guess as to whether people are going to move out of Minsk to the west to continue running World War Planes. I rather suspect they won't, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Which means that in theory, to keep World of War Planes running, Victor Kisley is going to have to either reassign staff um, that he currently has who are working in the west, or he's going to have to recruit a new team. And that both of those options are not easy. And for a niche game, which clearly World of Warplanes is, as you can see from Victor Kisley's uh, comments expressed here, that puts it in a vulnerable place. And what we're looking at now is the announcement on 4th of April 2022 by Wargaming declaring that it was going to leave Russia and Belarus. Um, and the question now is, what do we know, particularly with reference to World of Warplanes, some two months later? And the answer is not a lot, but what I do know, I will step through with you. What's showing on the screen now is the European World of Warplanes uh, Discord server. And right in the center of the screen, dated 19th of May, is a message from Blindfold. Now, if you don't know who Blindfold is, um, I believe she was a developer on World of Warplanes, but she was also acting in the role of community manager for the NA and EU servers. Well, to a degree, there was very little communication between uh, the World of Warplanes team and Western players. Um, it's hardly fair to call Blindfold a community manager in those circumstances. And what she says here is that today, the 19th of May, is my last day with Wargaming. So she's gone. Additionally, although it's not been officially confirmed so far as I know, the community manager on the Russian forum, um, Russian discords, I assume. Uh, Granoli has also departed. At least he hasn't been seen for a month unless he's popped up in the last couple of days and I haven't noticed it. So quite clearly, people are leaving Wargaming. And given the vulnerable state of the game, niche, and requiring staff to run it who won't necessarily transfer from Minsk, this is a little bit concerning. I'd be more concerned if I thought that the World of Warplanes Discord had simply been abandoned. However, it's better news here. A gentleman called XBK, and I've got his messages down the right here, has jumped in or been assigned, at least temporarily, to look after the World of Warplanes Discord. I don't know if he's going to look after the forum. Uh, but here's an important message dated the 31st of May. The World of Warplanes team is not disbanding. 
there's no plans for any changes in development or customer support. Well, that may be the view on the 31st of May. The 1st of June is a different day, but that's encouraging that it was said at all. That is under pressure is quite clear. Uh, although I can't guarantee quick responses to questions, problems that people are raising, as I'm sort of juggling tasks with three people and familiarizing myself with the changes over the last two years. And apparently he's been with World of Warplanes. I wasn't aware of that. Um, since launch and later switched to another role. Well, that's fairly typical. I've already mentioned Igaboo, who did exactly the same. However, that looks promising. It doesn't look as if Wargaming has immediate plans to close World of Warplanes. I didn't think it had. And it clearly is trying to shuffle its resources in order to keep World of Warplanes supported at least to a degree. And that's about as much as I know. And all I can say is watch this space when there are further developments I will discuss them in one of these videos. Let's turn to the second topic of this episode of Notes from the Control Tower, and it's the June deals. Wargaming is still pumping out deals for you to consider. It needs revenue in this time of transition, so that's no surprise. And the ones that uh, I'm going to talk about are gold bundles offering bonus items, specifically low to mid-tier premium aircraft. So if we take a look at the first of them, if you buy two and a half thousand gold in this bundle, you will also get uh, the Cadron Renault C.714 and a hang slot and a crew train to 100%. And as a second bundle, for five and a half thousand gold, you can get a bonus item, the Transport XF4U-1. And then finally, if you are in need of a quite a lot of gold, ten and a half thousand will bring you the Vickers Venom. And the question is, how desirable are these aircraft? Let's talk about that. Here's the Codron Renault C.714 on the tarmac outside my hangar. Uh, and what type of aircraft is it? It's a fighter at Tier 4. It's purporting to be a high-energy fighter, but it's got a couple of drawbacks, and I'll mention those straight away. The guns are third worst in class. You've got four 7.5mm machine guns. They're not really pokey enough for a high-energy fighter. And the other problem is this has the altitude performance of a turn fighter, not a high-altitude fighter. It can't really get up to where it needs to be to perform the role of a high-energy fighter. And additionally, it's got the worst in class climb rate. At speed, it's fairly decent. It's very fragile. Fighters are pretty fragile anyway, but this is uh, amongst the worst of the bunch. And the maneuverability is that of a high energy fighter. It's okay if you were able to perform in that role, but given the altitude performance, which is poor, uh, you may find it quite difficult. Uh, so this is not a desirable or strong aircraft. However, if you want two and a half thousand gold, it comes for free. And it does have one important benefit. This is a European aircraft, French specifically, which means that you can reassign it for 100,000 credits to any of the major nations and use it as a crew trainer. Moving on. We're looking at the XF4U-1, a Corsair prototype, and this is a tier five fighter. Not a multi-role, there is no ordinance on this, and um, that's unfortunate in my opinion. Uh, what has it got going for it? Well, it looks really chunky and robust, and indeed it is the best aircraft in terms of survivability figures at, uh, amongst the fighters at Tier 5. Uh, not that any fighter is particularly robust, but this will take a bit of punishment. And the other good characteristic it's got is it's second best in class as far as speed is concerned, with a class topping 15 seconds of boost. Um, and you need to remember that because you're going to have to use boost and speed as your main defensive uh, uh, method when you're being attacked by other aircraft. The good news pretty much stops there. Um, the weaponry is woefully weak. It's second worst in class, which is really frustrating in an, an aircraft which is basically intended to fly straight. Uh, and it ought to be high, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and hit other aircraft with an extremely good weaponry. It's not good weaponry. Um, and the maneuverability is second worst in class as well. Um, you're not going to be turn fighting with this. So immediately you'll be thinking, well, as long as I can get above them and dive on them and then boost away, I've got a viable attack method. That's going to be tricky. The air altitude performance is middling at best. It's definitely not anywhere near the best in class. It's not worst in class. It's just ordinary. And frankly, I find struggle to know what niche this aircraft belongs in. It doesn't have the necessary altitude performance nor the guns to be a true high energy fighter. Um, basically you can just go very fast, a peck away at aircraft, so ideally you'd be going for things like perhaps heavies uh, without a vicious tail gun uh, and bombers. 
uh, and targets of opportunity that aren't paying you any attention. But other than that, this is a pretty weak aircraft. Personally, I think it may be one of the worst premiums in the game. OK, time for the third aircraft. Here's the Tier 5 British fighter, the Vickers Venom, and I've done a full video on this aircraft in the past, so if you do want an in-depth look at it, go and look at that video. But in brief, um, it's got pretty decent guns. They're not best in class, but uh, they are capable, with one drawback, they have short range, only 1,400 feet or thereabouts, uh, and combined with another characteristic of the aircraft, uh, you'll find that frustrating. And the manoeuvrability is pretty high. Again, not best in class, but this is an agile aircraft and that's the good news. The bad news is, is particularly the airspeed. This aircraft is horribly slow. And I mentioned that the short range of the weaponry uh, is a problem combined with another characteristic. It's the speed. If you're trying to chase down another aircraft, very often it will be able to fly away from you and get outside of the range of your weapons uh, much more quickly than you can destroy it. Uh, and there are also problems with the maneuverability. Although it's good, it's got a horrible roll rate. And so watch out for that. If you get one of these on your tail and you can't boost away from it, then try rolling away from it. You probably could very well lose it. And it's got very poor altitude performance. So although I actually think the Vickers Venom is the best of the aircraft on offer in the June bu bundles, because in the right situation, the maneuverability in the guns can be made to work pretty effectively, it's not a strong aircraft either. Right, so I've taken a brief look at all three of the aircraft available in the June bundles and to sum up, one of them, the XF4U-1, is poor and the other two are so-so. None of them are essential, far from it. I hope you found that helpful, so let's move on to the next topic of this video. This part of the video is aimed at newer players because I'm going to talk about moving pilots between particularly tech tree aircraft. And for that purpose, let's imagine that I've just acquired this shiny new Spitfire 1, the Tier 5 British fighter, and I don't have a pilot for it. Uh, what do I do? Well, there are a couple of options. The first one is you can recruit a brand new pilot, and that's the option here. And you can do that, and you have recruitment options. You can recruit the pilot at 50% of proficiency, and I'll talk about proficiency in a moment. Uh, which is free, or you can spend 100,000 credits and get uh, a 90% uh, trained pilot, uh, and you can also spend gold and have the pilot ready to go, earning skill points and the like uh, from the very first time you fly it. And if you have the credits, I would recommend this option here, the third one, because it will only take you three or four battles to get to the pilot's proficiency up to 100%. You have another option, and I guess it's one that many will seek to take. They prefer a, a, a trained pilot to go into their aircraft, if at all possible. What can we do? Well, the obvious thing to do would be to take the pilot from the Tier 4 British fighter, the British, uh, the, the Bristol 146. Now, it doesn't have to be specifically from uh, another fighter. You can select a pilot of, from any class of aircraft. Let's just see if we can find the Bristol 146 pilot and there he is. Let's move him in here. Now there's a lot of red here, uh, so let's go and find out what that's telling us. Well, the first thing is here, I want you to look at the padlocks. One here on proficiency. Again, I will mention what proficiency is in a moment. And uh, one here on the skill points. Uh, think of proficiency this way. It's the assignment of the pilot to a specific aircraft. And unless he's specifically assigned to that aircraft, then this cannot be improved. And that's important. Let's just look at the text down here. Proficiency training is frozen. The crew member's proficiency does not match the aircraft. In other words, this is the Bristol 146 uh, pilot and he's sitting in the Spitfire 1. They do not match. Universal skills are reduced by 25%. If there were any special pilot skills, not applicable in this case, but they would be completely inactive. You cannot work towards receiving more skill points and basically the pilot is uh, less effective in this aircraft. So what can you do? Well, you can retrain him and you'll see similar options as you had when you were recruiting a pilot. 50% free, 90% 100,000 credits and 100% will cost you 400 gold. And this option will get the pilot from the very first battle um, fully effective with whatever skills he has, plus you'd be immediately earning, uh, uh, progressing towards your next skill point. Again, I would recommend this option if you have 100,000 credits, it will only take you three or four battles to get the pilot up to 100%. Now, once he has been retrained, my Bristol 146 pilot will be proficient on the Spitfire 1. 
Excellent. You have a pilot for both aircraft. That's what you may be thinking, but I'm afraid that's not the case. Pilots, crew members, can only be proficient on one aircraft at a time. And therefore, if you were to ever consider moving this pilot, having trained him for the Spitfire one, back to the Bristol 146, you would have to go through this process again. Bear that in mind. That covers moving crew between tech tree aircraft. What about moving crew into a premium plane? Well, the situation is different and the good news is you don't incur those penalties for having a pilot who is not trained or proficient on the premium aircraft. So let's illustrate this by looking at another tier five British fighter. This time it's a premium one, it's the Spitfire 1A. And here we have no pilot. Who could we put in there? Well, you could put in any pilot that you choose. Let's put in the Spitfire 1 pilot that uh, we've just been talking about. And there he is. And he's in the plane. Let's see what's happened. You can see that the proficiency is locked. You would expect that. The Spitfire 1 pilot is not assigned to the Spitfire 1A. There's no match. However, you'll notice that the skill points are not locked. You can still progress the training of this pilot in this aircraft and you will also earn 20% more experience in the premium aircraft, which is the real boon. In other words, your pilot will level up, level up more quickly in this premium aircraft than he will in the aircraft to which he's assigned. And this just tells you that the aircraft, uh, the pilot is fully capable in its aircraft. There is the warning about the proficiency being frozen. That does not matter in this case. You can, if you wish, train this pilot specifically for this aircraft. In fact, I do have a pilot specifically trained for the Spitfire Mark 1A and also, for example, the Tier 8 German fighter, the Horton 229. But generally, my premium planes do not have specific pilots. I will always look for a pilot I can train in them. And that concludes my remarks on moving crew between air aircraft. And I hope you found that helpful. And that's the end of this episode of Notes from the Control Tower. I hope you found some of that information useful and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. But until then, this is the Noble Q, signing out.